Father, we thank you once again for this moment and this opportunity. Lord, speak to our hearts. Speak to our hearts. Let every man hear you in their own language so that needs will be met by the Spirit of the living God. For did you not say that unto you shall the gathering of all the people be? Did you not say that in the presence of the Lord there is fullness of joy? At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Father, you said this, that we shall be satisfied with the fatness of your house and will drink of the rivers of your pleasure. This morning I pray, may we be satisfied indeed. Every single person, every single person that will walk out of this place with a sense of fulfillment that we met with the Lord. Pour out your joy in this place, O oh God. We thank you. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What I'm going to do today, <clears throat> for a while now, I've been talking about the journey to marriage. For a while now. And what I'm going to do today, I'll try and bring that series to a close so that we can teach some other things and then later on we'll come back to it. Because these are things that we need to emphasize, we need to talk about so that people are not mistaken, people are not confused. And if I may give you a quick encapsulation of the things I have said. I've said that marriage was designed by God. Say that with me. Not by man. The concept, the idea of marriage came from heaven. God designed marriage. And marriage is so important that when you look at the Bible, there are two ordinances in the Bible here on earth that is also reproduced in heaven. Two ordinances. One is the Holy Communion. Jesus said that I will eat of the Holy Communion with you here before my crucifixion and after I will eat it again when we get to heaven. I will eat it again in heaven. Then the concept of marriage in the book of Genesis we see marriage. God said it's not good for man to be alone. He brought man, created man and then he created a woman and he gave the woman to man. And both men and women came from God. Say that with me. Both men and women came from God. So God has a masculine and a feminine aspect to God. Both men and women came from God. He made created man in his image. So in Genesis, we see the concept of marriage being exemplified, being expressed, and being practicalized. For this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and be cleaved to his wife, and there shall no more be two, but there shall be what? One. God's arithmetic. One plus one is equal to one. When you get to the New Testament, the first miracle that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, did, the first miracle, the first time we see him in public performing a miracle, where was that? It was at a wedding. It was a wedding. He turned water into wine, at a wedding. The importance of marriage. Jesus could have behaved like John the Baptist and refused to go for the wedding when he was invited. But he went. He went. And when he went there, he made sure that there was gladness. There was joy. There was fulfillment. And there was no shame and reproach on the bride and on the bridegroom. Or the parents of the bride and the bridegroom who were the ones organizing the wedding. So he provided a miracle when they ran out of wine. And in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, we see Jesus Christ again in a marriage ceremony with the bride. And which is the bride? The church is his bride. So, a wedding, marriage, Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Marriage, first miracle of Jesus Christ in John's gospel. John was the one who said that um, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And then a marriage again in the last book of the Bible. So, marriage on earth, marriage in heaven. And that's why the devil fights tooth and nail. Fights so hard to disrupt the foundation, the concept, the sanctity, the sacredness of marriage. Because he was in heaven. You remember? Lucifer was in heaven. 
He saw it. And, and if you notice, even the, the battle, the thing that led to the collapse of man, the fall of man, the disobedience of man, was the devil coming between the man and his wife. So he wanted to rip apart, not just that relationship, but destroy the plan of God for man on earth. And Adam made the biggest mistake that a man could make at that time, based on his limited knowledge. He chose to eat the fruit with his wife. So instead of dying for his wife, he died with his wife. And that is why when the second Adam came, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Jesus decided that he would not die with his bride. He would die for his bride. So when the devil told him, if you are the son of God, fall down and worship me. If you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. If you are the son of God, do this and do that. Jesus said, no, I've seen that trick before. The lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh. The same temptation that the Lucifer tempted um, Eve. The same temptation. Jesus said, affliction will not rise up a second time. And so he overcame every one of them. So that we can be free. So that we can be wedded into a holy matrimony that will exist in perpetuity. Glory to God. Glory to God. So marriage is important. Marriage is important. Marriage is sacred. Marriage is honored in heaven. The Bible says, see what the devil is doing. I don't know if it's the devil, it's me now. I didn't, I didn't put it well. Onus. I'm a protocol guy. Next time we'll do this in well, okay? Good. So, Marriage is so important and the devil just wants to rip it apart. But God is interested and by the grace of God, he will settle it for you in the name of Jesus Christ. So I've given you, I've told you, I said, it's important for you to prepare for marriage, you pray for marriage and in the course of getting married, now when I, finish, when I preach this message, some, somebody came to me and said that, Pastor, what you said was not only applicable to single people, it's also applicable to married people. Number one, personhood development. Personhood preparation. You are constantly developing your person. You do not cease to develop your person because you got married. And I, I remember saying something that, you know, when I, when I preached it and, you know, um, somebody sent me a note, which, which I want to correct, um, that um, I, I talked about uh, women not taking care of themselves after they get married. I mean, it's not just women who don't take care of themselves after they get married. You know, men, there are men who don't take care of themselves too after they get married. Am I correct? Women talk to me now. Women, yeah, there are men who don't take care of themselves. Yeah. You know, you got married to this posh and tush girl. You know. And all the effort she has made to teach you how to use cutleries. You say, that's not how I eat. Come on. Every time you go out, you embarrass her. Didn't you know that? You embarrass her. So you've got to keep developing yourself. 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 Be sensitive to the comments, the opinion, the expressions of your partner. You've got to be of your spouse. You've got to be sensitive. Not just in courtship. Not just be when you are single. But even when you are married. Personhood development. Find out what God has called you to do. And at every phase of your life, because when I talk about your prophetic mandate, it changes from time to time. Because as you develop and as you grow, let's say for instance, when you are in primary school or elementary school, what you can do is limited by your age, by your size, by your resources. Am I correct? But as you graduate from college and you have more resources, that's when God may say, okay, I want you to start sponsoring some students in college. I want you to start investing in the lives of other people. You know, he will not place that demand on you when you are still at a very pediatric phase in life, elementary phase in life. But as you grow older, as you move forward, he places a demand on you. But overall, there's something distinct that God has called you to do. You've got to find out and pursue it. 
And your responsibility as a spouse, as a partner, is to assist that person to find that mandate in life. Amen. Amen. Number two, I talked about character development, character preparation. If you are looking for a spouse, it's important for you to look for character. Look for character. Forget the, 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 the bells and the whistles. Forget, forget all the, the designer paraphernalia. Because my let me tell you, those things will not last at home. No, they, they won't last at home. It's the character of the person. And what is character is who you are when nobody is watching. What, what do you, men, men, let me ask you a question. Men, what do you do when you walk out to the mall and you see a sister dragging a big bag? Dragging a big bag. What do you do? You, you, you just greet her and you walk away. Say, sister, the Lord bless you. What do you do? Whatever you are saying to yourself, may it be something good. <laughs> Ladies, what do you do when a guy stops by at your house? And even if he doesn't tell you he's hungry, what do you do when he stops by? Give him a bottle of water. <laughs> what do you do? Character, hospitality, gentleness, meekness, humility. Those things are critical. Amen. Honor. Honor, integrity, those things are critical. Character. And then I talk about spiritual development, spiritual preparation. You want to look for a man who has character. You want to look for a man who is growing spiritually, who has a sense of direction about my work with God. You're looking for a woman who has character, who is developing spiritually. Forget all this Egyptian accent, you know, South African gait, and, you know, Peruvian hair. Forget all that crap. You want somebody who has substance. You want somebody who, you know, you know one of the things that many of our sisters, I hear many of our sisters say, they said, they said, you say, Pastor, our men are so flaky. They say, Pastor, our men are so empty. They are so vain. They are so carnal. You want to date a girl for only one reason. Not because you are thinking of marriage, but because you are thinking of what? You are thinking of the sheets. What you do under the sheets. I remember one of our sisters, she went out for, for a date with a guy. In the restaurant, she said the guy touched her in a funny place. And she slapped him in the restaurant. Bam! <laughs> that people looked. <laughs> he just slapped him. You're going out for, with a girl for the first time. And you're touching her. She said she wanted to walk. She, the man touched her in the behind. He just bam. If a guy does that to you, slap him well. In this Me Too age in particular, give him a dirty slap. Amen. Spiritual development. Do you fear God? Grow in the grace and in the knowledge of Christ. Say that with me. Grow in the grace and in the knowledge of Christ. Grow in that grace and grow in that knowledge. Grow in your brokenness. Paul said that, he said that, I, he said, I count everything. Let's have that passage if you have it there. Philippians chapter 3. We didn't read it last week. Philippians chapter 3 verse 7. Verse seven. He said, Paul said that everything else is immaterial. I count everything dung for the excellency of knowing Christ and pursuing him. He said, that's what matters. So in your brokenness, you're growing. Today, let me talk about financial preparation. Financial development. Thank you. Financial preparation. I may not have that much time. Let me just quickly run into it. Financial preparation. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 12. The reason why it's important for a man and a woman to think about finances as you are walking towards marriage is found in that passage. What, what does it say? 
He said, for wisdom is what? It's a defense. And what else is a defense? Money is a defense. Money is a defense. Wisdom is a defense. I, I've said it here before. Brethren, anointing without money is annoyance. You may be dripping with oil until you glow in the dark. But when there's no money, oh, you'll be so angry. you come to church and when you preach, people will be wondering who you... <laughs> I mean, look at the video we just saw. Look at all the things we have done in this place. Look at... These walls have sound barriers in them. They have, been, they have been reinforced in such a way that they have sound barriers so that the sound does not affect the junior church, affect the other section. And we are, we're still going to do a lot more. We've bought new sound system at the back. We're going to buy some, you know, very exotic, appropriate things in this place. Look at the children's church, what we are doing there. When we are done with the children's church, when your children come to church, they will say, I'm not going home today. This is where I'm staying. I remember when my, my children went to one of these churches on one occasion. When they came back, the following Sunday, Joel said, Daddy, that's where I'm going to. I'm not coming to see you, David. You know? <laughs> that's what we want to do here. Amen. So you, money is a defense. Money is a defense. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, Paul told, uh, Paul told Timothy, he said, a man who cannot provide for his house is worse than an infidel, an unbeliever. It was like somebody who does not know God. So money is critical. Money is important. Now, that does not become the parameter, the indices by which you evaluate your choice of a spouse. No. But there are other things that the man does or the woman does that will make you determine whether this is the person you should go with or you should run for your life. They don't just look at the man and say, oh, come from a rich family. He has a, a great heritage. You know, he's a Trumpian. You know, you just follow the person. <laughs> Pastor Bina. <Peter. laughs> I just be producing lies every day. <laughs> Praise you the Lord. So the Bible says, the man is the head of the home. Am I correct? Ephesians chapter 5 verse 23. The man is, Ephesians 5.23, the man, the husband is what? Is the head of the wife. Look at it on the screen, everybody. The husband is what? Read it with me. The husband is what? The head of the wife. Let's just stop there. The husband is the head of the wife. And the husband is actually the head of the home. So if you are head of the wife, who should be providing for the house? We may say it aloud. The man should be providing for the house. The man should be. So, man, it's important for you to think financially. It's important. Think financially. Think of how you are going to be strong financially. Think of how you are going to educate your family financially. Now, in this age, there are women who make more money than their husbands. Am I correct? That's what, the, that's what the world is. Let's not deny that. So the woman makes more money than the man. So the woman is not going to be hiding her money and holding the man ransom and insulting the man and humiliating the man because you make more money than the man. Because as a matter of fact, the money you make is to help the man become more effective. Woman was made to help a man. Am I correct? Uh-huh. Now, if people have gone quiet, <laughs> people have gone quiet. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you, know, I, you know, I won't exhaust that topic today. I'm just giving you, this one, what I'm giving you is just a skeleton because we'll come back and deal with that. Because there are men whose wives make more money than them and the men are intimidated, the men are angry, the men are arrogant, the men are wasteful, the men are cocky. The men are not compassionate. When a woman is making money, more money than you, shouldn't you treat her like an egg? <laughs> I wish I can hear what she's saying. I can't hear. Envy will not allow him. Yeah, because there are some men like that. They get angry that their wife is making more money and instead of 
treaty supporting the woman instead of encouraging the woman, instead of managing the money wisely. They get jealous. They get angry. They get envy. They abuse the woman. They condemn the woman. You're a fool. You're a fool. Because God has sent you a blessing. And what are you doing? You are condemning. You are troubling. You are threatening that blessing. Because if you take care of this woman who is providing all this money for you, at the end of the... You see, women are very easy to deal with. They, she will give you all that money and you'll be managing it. No, 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 no. There, there are men like that. No, there are men who will be foolish, who will be, who will be, who will be wasteful with the money. There are men like that. But there are other men who are good men, who will manage the money well. They will plan well for the family. No, there are men like that. So, so those of you who are single, in the period of dating, these are some of the things you want to look out for. You want to find out. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 4 to 5. I'm not talking about the man's responsibility about money or the woman's responsibility, because we don't have time for that. Ezekiel 28, verse, verse 4 to 5. Look at it. He said, with your wisdom and your understanding, you have done what? You have gained riches. It was actually talking about the devil there. But he says that, how do you gain riches? With wisdom and understanding. You gather gold and silver into your treasures with what? Wisdom and understanding. Next verse, it says, it says, by your great wisdom in trade, you have increased your riches. So you acquire wealth by wisdom and by understanding. You don't have to be a Christian to acquire wealth. You don't have to be. I mean, there's a man called Warren Buffett. He's called the, um, there's a name they call him, the, um, the Oracle of Omaha. Every year during spring, people gather to listen to his wisdom and sagacity in, 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 in wealth acquisition, in wealth accumulation, and in wealth uh, expansion. People, there was a guy who I read, one guy was saying that, I think he paid how much? He paid over $100,000 to go for a meeting where he will have lunch with this man, Warren Buffett. And he said that the counsel that the man gave him helped him to become a millionaire. There are people who have the wisdom, who have the knowledge. You don't have to be a Christian to be wealthy. I hope you understand that. The wisdom. So it says by wisdom and knowledge, you accumulate wealth. You need to be financially intelligent. Whether you're a man or a woman. So during courtship, you're looking out. Is this man looking at somebody who is going to be financially intelligent or is just a waster? You must be willing to borrow vessels. Second Kings chapter 4, verse 1 to 7. How do you become financially intelligent? You borrow vessels. Say that with me. Borrow vessels. Say that aloud. Borrow vessels. Second Kings chapter 4. It talks about a woman who was the wife of one of the prophets. And very likely that woman, that prophet must have been a contemporary of Elisha. The woman went to Elisha and said, your servant, my husband is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord and the creditors is coming to take my two sons to be his wife. Fearing the Lord is not enough to make you wealthy. There's more you need to do. And may God give us that wisdom in Jesus' name. It says, so Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? Look at the question Elisha asked her. What do you have in the house? And she said, I have nothing. He said, however, there's a jar of oil. Somebody say that with me, a jar of oil. Open your mouth and say it. Just a jar of oil. That's all I have in the house. A cruise of oil. What do you have in the house? Now, what that lesson teaches us is that, or the lesson from that passage is that, regardless of how broke, bust, and disgusted you are, there is something remaining that God can use to turn your life around. And that thing that God will use to turn your life around is always proximal to you. It's either in your hands, in your house, or nearby. In Revelation, Jesus told the church, he said, strengthen that which remains. You want to identify what is that thing that is remaining? 
So the woman goes on. Elijah said to her, he says, next verse please. Go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors. Empty vessels do not gather just a few. Go and borrow vessels. He didn't ask her to go borrow the, the all. He said borrow vessels. Vessels are the things that you collect from others. The ideas, the inspiration, the lessons you learn from others. And then you now use that which is inherent within to amplify and expand your portfolio. Should I say that again? Vessels are the ideas you borrow from others. The ideas you learn from others. The, 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 the inspiration you get from others. And then you use what is within to amplify your portfolio. Let me give you an example. When you went to school, what, what did you learn? What was the first thing they taught you in school that helped you to speak well? What was that thing? To speak and to write. What was that thing? They taught you alphabets. That was all they gave you. They gave you alphabets. And A to Z, 26 letters. That is what you got. You own that. Now, your whole vocabulary is built on what that fundamental thing you learn that everybody else learns. They don't give you the intelligence. You develop that intelligence. You improve on your speaking by listening to others and by speaking often. You improve on your writing by reading what others have written and, and writing consistently. But you borrow the vessels. You borrow the ideas. You read from others. You learn what others are writing in order for you to expand. Look at musical now. now. In the music. How many notes do we have on the musical on the keyboard? How many keys? We have 12 keys. I'm talking about... Um, 88. Huh? 88. Let's not talk about that one because me, I'm, I'm as confused as you two. So <laughs> let's talk about the one that I know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> let's go quickly so that because I'm running out of time. So everything you need is around you or in the hands of someone else. So the man is the head of the home. The man must provide for the home. However, Proverbs chapter 31, let's quickly, Proverbs 31, we'll read from verse 10, very quickly, I'm running out of time. From verse 10, who can find a virtuous woman? For she is far above rubies. Let's go on, let's go on. What does she do? Her husband trusts in her safely, so he will have no lack of gain. Next verse. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. Quickly, quickly. She seeks wool and flax and willingly walks with her hands. Regardless of her long nails, she walks with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar off. She also rises while it is yet night, provides food for her household and a portion for, of her, for her maids, maid servant. She considers a field and she buys it. And from her profit, she continues to expand her portfolio. I'm going to stop there. For women who think that the burden is only on the man to provide financial stability for the house. A virtuous woman, look at the thing she does. Go back and read it. We don't read that passage well enough. So it's not just on the man, but on the woman too. If the woman is more financially intelligent, she supports the man. But if the man is more financially intelligent, what does he do? He guides the woman into financial expansion. Amen. Take lessons on investing and investment. Will somebody say amen? amen. Take lessons on investing and investment. First Kings chapter 10, verse 28 to 29 1 Kings 10, 28 to 29. So Solomon had horses. In, who was the richest, the wisest man up until Jesus showed up? Who was the wisest man? Solomon. And with all his wealth, God told Solomon, he said, listen, I will not only give you wisdom, I will also bless you with riches that nobody will be compared to you, right? He said, Solomon had horses imported from Egypt and Kevev. And the king's merchants bought them in Kevev at the current price. They bought them at the current price. And what did they do? And then they sold them. Look at it. They sold them, exported them to the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Syria. 
Solomon, the wisest man, he bought at a price, he put a margin, and then he did what? He sold. Investment ideas. Investment ideas. You learn investment ideas. You can learn them. You find out. When you, when you, when you, I'm going to ask you this. When you open the news in the morning, what, what do you look out for? Horoscopy, right? Because that's what some people look for. Know your stars. And then they tell you that today you'll meet somebody with the green shoes. He will smile at you. Find out what's going on in the market. Find out what's going on in the world. Find out. Today, now for instance, in Atlanta, the housing market in Atlanta is exploding. How many of you know that? It's exploding. I remember many years ago, five, six, five, eight, seven, five, eight, seven, five. A guy came to me. He told me, he came from California. He said, Pastor Joe, when you see him, you'll think he's one of those Jai Jai guys. He said, Pastor Joe, ah, I have my head on my neck and I know how to make investments. I remember he bought a property. He had a property in, in LA which he wanted to sell. The market was going down. I said, hey, don't sell that property yet. Just hold on for a while. Came to Allah. He said, wanted to sell the property, move to Allah. I said, don't sell that property. He came back to thank me that he didn't sell that property. Because the value of that property had gone up four times when the market turned, turned around. A lady went to um, south, south of Atlanta and bought a couple of properties for $20,000, $20,000. In about two, three years later, those properties were going for $70,000. I mean, where else do you make that kind of 200% money without too much sweat? Oh, yeah, I know there's a place where you can make it. 419, yeah. Mm -hmm. You can make it. But that one, the sweat, you sweat. You cannot even sleep with that one. I hear that there are some folks who don't come to this church anymore because they felt that Pastor Joe is against them. It's against their enterprise. May that enterprise fail in the name of Jesus. Wicked enterprise. So you learn these things. You learn this. Atlanta is exploding, like I was saying, the housing market. And some of you, when you get your tax return, instead of thinking of how to invest it into real estate, you go and buy another leather jacket. Or you, you, or you go and buy, you, you, you are crazy about this car. Oh, no. You go and buy the car cash. The moment you drive that car from the dealership, it depreciates in value. The moment you drive it out, by at least $5,000, four to $5,000. So this is the time. Look for some properties to buy. Invest into them. In three, four, five years time, the thing will explode. Let me give you a secret. I, I, I was reading that one. I, that one really got me angry. You know, I'm one of those people who have been prophesying that Amazon will come to Atlanta. Amazon will come to Atlanta. Why? Because I know when they come, things get better. You guys are looking at me like this, like as if I'm a cinema. I'm telling you. I don't know how many of you read the news. It was a realtor who told me they were, they, they were going to build the biggest factory, battery production factory in the whole of the U.S., North America, somewhere on 85 of Georgia. Did you hear that news? Yeah. The biggest battery production factory for electric cars on 85 of Georgia. I was so excited. I already driven around that area because I know what will happen. By the time they are hiring over 2,000 employees whose average income will be over $1,000, uh, $100,000. What do you think will happen to the real estate around that area? Those are the things you should be reading. When you see all this Gwinnett news, you know, those are the things you should read. When I read that they had bought um, this uh, Gwinnett, Gwinnett, Mall of, uh, Gwinnett Mall, you know it, right? For $23 million, I was a bit depressed. Because I said, all I needed to do was look for 23 friends of mine who will bring a million dollar each and we buy that place, explode 
that place up. Build town homes, build condo, build some shopping complexes, and then you on 8 a.m. in the morning I'll be playing golf. Do you understand what I'm saying? But we're not thinking like that. All we are thinking about, oh, I'm back. Oh, I'm back. You go on three vacations in a year when you are not a, a surgeon. <laughs> three vacations in a year. You spend the money on all, all kinds of things. That does not make sense to me. You learn those things from other people. You learn them. You see the way they invest. You see the way they plan. You, you learn from them. And we're always thinking of 419. You don't get involved in downward assets. Downward assets. I've talked about one of them. Where you buy a brand new car. With that money, you could have bought something a bit cheaper. And then invest part of that money. Am I making sense to somebody this morning? Oh, come on. Talk to me this morning. One of the things you need to do is pay off your credit card debt. And everybody say... Yeah. Because it's based on compound interest. Pay off your credit card debts. Be aggressive about that. Sell some of those shoes on eBay. Pay them off. Because you can't start accumulating wealth. If you're not, if you're, if you've not exhausted, you're dead. I'm running out of time. Perhaps I'll continue this message next week. What do you think? Uh, I don't have a choice. I'll continue it next week. Because there's so much I want to say here. Because now is the time. Thou shall arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor her. Yeah, the set time is when? Now. No. Say it with me. The set time is when? No. Now. Transfer of wealth. God is, God is breathing prosperity upon his people. And he wants us to be wise. He wants us to be wise. Say the children of this world are wiser than the children of, of the children of the world, yeah, are wiser than the children of light. Why? Because we don't know how to manage money. And all we are saying that all oh, the wealth of the just is uh, the wealth of the unjust is, pre is preserved for the for the righteous. You think God is a fool? When you don't know how to manage five thousand dollars, he will now give you five million dollars so that you will commit suicide. Oh, God is not a fool. He manages, he gives resources to people who can manage them. Let me end by telling you this. How many of you have ever lost money in any business transaction? Be honest. Speak the truth now and let the devil be put to shame. You've ever lost money in any business transaction? Be honest. Including stock market. Never lost money. Stella, you've never lost money. You look at me like this. I know you, you've lost some money now, haven't you? Yeah. If you've ever lost money, raise up your hand. Please, be honest. Should I tell you something? That money did not leave the world. Where do you think that money is? It did not leave the world. The money is still in this world. It's still in the world. It just left your hands into some other person's hands. When we talk about restoration, part of what God is going to do is that that money that left your hands and much more than that money will come back into your hands. The money did not leave the world. It just went into somebody's other person's hand. May that money come back to your hands. In the name of Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we thank you this morning. Just go ahead, tell the Lord. Father, we thank you. We bless you today. We give you praise and glory. Thank you for your word. Thank you for talking to me about financial capability, financial preparation, financial independence, financial possibility, financial advancement. Father, thank you. Lord, open my eyes. Give me wisdom. Give me knowledge. Give me understanding. Connect me to people who would help me, oh God. Father, help me. Connect me. Connect me. Connect me. Create opportunities of financial advancement in my own life, oh God. Father, I ask you, help me, Lord. I ask you, Father, help me. I thank you and I bless you. I give you praise and I give you glory. For in Jesus' much less name we pray.